Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Jim Orr. Jim, welcome to State of Mind Studios. How are you? Hi Paul, thanks for inviting me to the podcast. It's great. This is your fourth appearance, isn't it? Is it? Aye, it's your fourth appearance, Jim. Um, The last time we spoke to you was all around the Bend It Like Bratback shows. You then joined us at Cathkin Park for a wee update. We'll be talking about your next uh, project, which is in the works as we speak. We'll be talking about that as well. And we'll have a look back to the season so far, the Celtic season so far, and your thoughts on that. You've been a long-time Celtic supporter. How far back does your... Celtic supporting life go. When, when was your first game? I said to you, first time I was on, I was I was somebody who did much further play football. Mm. Uh, I tend to play football up until my mid teens, so it was kind of late seventies. Uh, the Alfie Con era. That's when I started going. The Alfie Con era. He and was even, a, he was a controversial signing, wasn't he? And even then, I would tend to go in midweek games because I was playing football on a Saturday. But I got to the point maybe twenty one, twenty two when I stopped playing football altogether. And my old man used to always say, if you can play football, play football. You've got plenty of time to watch football. So. I think from 78, 79, 79, 80, 10 men won the league. I think from then on, that's when I started kind of going a lot more consistently. Uh, yeah, from that year onwards. 10 men winning the league to going for 10 in a row. And you've seen it all really. But I think, I remember you and I were exchanging emails back and forward uh, for a spell. And I was looking at your name, Jim, and I was wondering, is it the same Jim Orr? Is it the same Jim Orr who was involved in uh, Save Ourselves? And that's how... You and I kind of got to know each other. You came in to the Tollbooth in Stirling and we spoke about the Celtic takeover back in the 1990s. Um, so that it seems like a long time ago, almost 30 years ago now. Yeah, four years to the 30th anniversary of Fergus coming along and saving the club. Yeah, uh, Things have moved on quite a bit since then. I mean, we could never imagine back then when, when Rangers went for nine in a row that we would suddenly be going for nine in a row and now, and now ten. So this is, and this is the season. I know, this is the season now. The thing is as well, we were, we were talking uh, this morning before coming on, Jim, about the current situation at Celtic. Don't want to labour uh, COVID every single day. We all hear enough of it, we see enough of it on social media, but obviously it is affecting um, Celtic players at the moment. And I was asking you, you know, what well, Scotland have qualified. We've got through slimly. No, yeah. Penalty yeah. shot out. Well, they've the qualified final. for the next, the next game. We've got another game, another right. game. We're through, we're through. Um, is it not about time... The Celtic players just came back. Are they really needed? But there'll be things preventing Celtic from pulling them back. Unfortunately, it's a FIFA issue. We've got two guys already on international duty who are isolating in Edward and Christie. We've got loads of other players out there and I'm less concerned about injuries. I'm more concerned about more of them testing positive. Uh, is there anything that can be done by the clubs? I think these are obviously exceptional times. And I'm saying to you earlier, the thing about the football these days, there's, there's a bit of it that you can have some element of, you know what you're doing, you can control this, but anything to do with COVID, you can't control it at all, and things are changing day by day. And I think UEFA should be looking at maybe making some exceptions for things. I think if you if you put your player forward in, in all good faith, and then they're having to self-isolate and miss games, there should mm. be some method, mechanism by which you can then say we can maybe uh, not have to play certain games because through no fault of our own. If a player gets injured, then fair enough, that's just part and parcel of it. Uh, I think it's difficult, because uh, Scotland are playing three games in about, what, six days? Yeah. Something like that. Mm-hmm. The one last night, that's a Euro 2021 20, qualifier. Good game, important game, we'll get through that, and that's great. The next two games, the Nations League is a bit Mickey Mouse. I think that should have been cancelled this year. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be a disaster if we end up losing any of the players for the next game because of this Mickey Mouse tournament. And if we do lose players, I think there should be some mechanism by which we could say, well, through no fault of our own, we've lost a couple of players for a major game, we're allowed to not have to play that game, we can postpone that game. Something like that should be in place. I mean, the thing that annoys me about this season, this, this should have been the big season. And I think since we we got five, six in a row, it was always wait to the ten in a row season. Yeah. And last year was manic, and the whole, the whole nine in a row thing. But it was good fun, and dead exciting. And it's a shame it ended... It ended, but it was great, and you think, right, on to the 10. And the fact you can't actually go and watch the games. Uh, and this would be, it would be mental at the games, you know, because uh, last season, you know, managed to sell out all the season tickets. You couldn't get a ticket for games, mm-hmm. because I've got, I've got a few friends who don't have season tickets, couldn't get them tickets for the games. And every game, you know, every every point's a prisoner, you had to win the games. Dead exciting. 
and then you think we'll just wait till the 10 season this will be, this will be brilliant and it's kind of football but not as we know it and I find the whole closed door thing hard to get my head around because it just seems like you go over the park watching a bunch of amateur teams playing you know, there's no atmosphere there's kind of nothing and it must be hard for the players I think so. Left themselves. I think so, particularly for a team like Celtic, where you know the the support is um, obviously world renowned for being influential, not only for your own players but for the opposition. But I think when you're watching that, one or two things that I have picked up on is uh, you know Duffy, and because you can hear players talking and shouting, and I've spoken about his influence over Chris Iyer, who is a player that I I think. You know, great. I, I really admire Chris Iyer, Jim, but I do think that um, Duffy's very influential on Iyer, and he's playing more like a centre half rather than a rampaging midfielder. And I said that yesterday to Stevie Millen. We've seen a lot less of um, his lung bursting runs, uh, runs through the midfield, even though he was involved in um, the all important opening goal against St Johnson. Now, the tension in this room is bad enough. Imagine being at the game, as you say, going for the 10. Uh, when you think back to those um, dark days, late 80s, early 90s, where you were looking at Celtic accounts and you were thinking something needs to be done here, did you ever think the day would come that you'd be sitting here talking about 10 in a row? I think nobody could envisage what's, what's actually happening just now. Uh, I think getting back to the COVID thing, I think my, my big concern is a kind of lack of clarity as to what happens next. Mm. And if we're depending on the SPFL board or the SFA, that's my big concern because I think they showed last year and how they how they dealt with the vote that you know that they're shambolic. And the SFA are shambolic. And beforehand we were kind of chatting about and I, I was making the point about we look at who's in charge of the SFA. You know, the, the person who's in charge of the SFA should be a kind of Experienced businessman, mover and shaker, moves and shakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, been in charge of a major business, knows what they're doing. We've got the guy who used to be the managing director of Partick Thistle. Uh, and that's no disrespect to the guy, but we've got a system in place that lets the managing director of Partick Thistle be the most important person in Scottish football. Yeah. And then we've got a situation where, back when the COVID there, we're going to lose Ryan Christie for this game next week through no fault of his own. So something's went wrong somewhere. And I know we're in a bit of a blame culture, but we're looking to see, well, who's actually fault was this? Because we've we've given one of the, in my opinion, one of our best players to the national team. He doesn't have COVID, but he has to self-isolate. So if you're, if you're Neil Lennon, you'd be absolutely furious about yeah, this. Absolutely. So we have to understand what's happened so it doesn't happen again. But we also need to understand, I mean, I'd be astonished if we get through this season. I'd be astonished if we play 38 league games, finish last year's cup, Finish this year's cup, finish this year's league cup, all the Europa League games and all these international games. I don't think we'll finish this season. So if we don't finish it, what happens next? And nobody's told me, unless I missed a meeting, nobody's told me what happens next. You missed a memo, Jim. Because I can't be the only paranoid Celtic fans. I'm a, I'm a paranoid and I've good, good right to be paranoid. I'm actually not paranoid enough at times, given what's happened over the last 20 years or so. But my point being that I can't be the only paranoid Celtic fan when we dropped the points at Colmarnock. And last season's big thing was the points per game. And you're thinking, hold on, what's the points per game? Oh, it's, it's less than the bad guys. What if they call the league after three games? Nah, they wouldn't call it after three games, but they might. You never know. Because it says Scottish football. Because it's Scottish football, and we don't know what's happening. So somebody has to tell me, and the reason they have to tell me is because I've paid out 600 quid in a season ticket I hope my wife's not listening to this I've paid out 600 quid in a season ticket and I've got Sky and I've got BT and I've got Premier and I've done pay-per-view at Ross County and I've so I'm pouring all this money as are you Paul and 50,000 other Celtic fans and the 40,000 of the bad guys are putting money in Hibs and Aberdeen and all these guys are throwing all this money in and we don't know what's going to happen next and I think personal opinion again we'd have to play a significant amount of games for it to be not to be called null and void and part of me thinks maybe they should just call it null and void because hopefully we're back to normal next season and that's the 10 season and maybe that's the time we get to go to the games because that's the thing we're all missing because uh, it's a hard enough time as it is but if people had the games to look forward to mm-hmm. at least and I, I, don't, I don't go to the away games but I've now started maybe about a couple of years ago my, my kind of Saturday ritual is I go to Malone's pub for, for the Celtic AM for Yeah I've seen you there a few times Jim. For anyone who doesn't know about Celtic AM f- f- fantastic thing in Malone's pub in Sucky Hall Lane where a lovely guy called Andrew Millen runs uh, as it's a two hour session before every home game and Andrew's there and he'll interview maybe three or four people who are 
I've got Celtic leanings. It could be an ex-player. People like Simon Donnelly have been there. Bobby Petter, John Farlin, Frank McIverney, mm. Frank McGarvey have been there. Paul John Dykes has been there. I've been there. They so, were scraping the barrel that I week, Jim. So, uh, <laughs> so Big Angel will interview three or four people and then there's some music. I called Danny Kelly will play kind of Celtic songs. You get a free bacon roll. So, so I've started going there and I've started catching a lift on the McConnell's supporters bus at the top of Hope Street. So, and I, I used my bus pass because I got my bus pass last year to get into the, So that's my Saturday ritual and that's been taken away. So, so it's disappointing not to have that. Never mind the games. The fact that you've got ritual. And I don't go to away games. And I can only imagine that the guys that are going up to Ross County and Aberdeen and stuff like that have been doing this for years mm-hmm. and not to be able to do that, you know. I mean, obviously, there's more important things in life in football. But it's, uh, it's, but it's a social aspect part. as People well, Jim. That's the highlight yeah, of the week. Absolutely. And I said the game last Sunday, I mean, it'd have been brilliant to have been there, scoring the goals right at the death and coming back up the road. It'd have been, it'd have been brilliant. So we're all missing that this year. And, uh, and hopefully we get some sort of vaccine to get us back to some sort of normality as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. And again, just a big shout out to Billy Stark as well, former self Billy Stark, one of the nicest fellas I've ever met uh, in the world of football, Jim, over the years. And um, he's also tested positive for COVID-19. So hopefully um, he's safe and well when he gets over that. Because, I mean, I don't, I'm thinking back to the centenary season now and the I think it was 60 grand we paid uh, for Billy Stark and he was one of the best players that season he was he brilliant pound for pound he was a fantastic oh, signing excellent uncapped as well never capped for Scotland was he Billy Stark I don't think so no and we're talking about Scotland because I'm being selfish I'm just looking at the situation where right uh, Scotland uh, have got through to this playoff it's happening no- in November um, is it not about time that the, the club were able somehow and I know there would be regulations preventing us preventing us from doing so what if we lose another three four players Ryan Christie's you know apparently playing games with Stuart Armstrong and Kieran Tierney so Tierney and, and um, Christie are now having to self-isolate mm-hmm. my biggest concern about that also the, the, the wider concern is Christie is his buddies or he's associating quite closely with the two guys who are down in England making the big bucks down in England the two former Celtic teammates that definitely rubs off on um, players playing in Scotland Jim we've seen it with Lou McCarry and Scotland get togethers and you know mm-hmm. Ryan Christie seems destined to move down there and follow his two mates I think at times as football fans I think we're a wee bit naive that we think people want to play for the jersey and I know that because at the end of the day, it's a job. It's a job of work. We were, we were chatting beforehand about, uh, I was making the point that people are saying things like, well, it'd be good if we played in England. And mm. I was saying, just be careful what you wish for. Because I would, I'd find it difficult uh, if we were down in England and we became like an Arsenal, say, and we're paying players £200,000 a week. Or 200, Mesut Ozil's won apparently £350,000 a week. And given kind of like where Celtic have came from, how the club was founded, etc. If you're a Celtic fan, would you be comfortable with paying a player two hundred thousand pound a week? Mm. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be. And and I don't know how much the players are on. And you hear stories about how much players are on. But for the sake of argument, say Scott Brown's on twenty five grand a week. I'm kind of comfortable with that. And twenty five grand, my understanding is, is maybe roughly. The average annual wage. So Scott Brown earns in a week what the average person earns in a year. Mm-hmm. Are you comfortable with that, Jim? Aye. What if we paid Scott Brown 100 grand a week? Hmm, I'm not so comfortable with that. So I think you have to look at those kind of things and the whole actual, how the, how the club's wage structure works, not just Celtic, how the whole thing works. How much do you pay people? Uh, I find that fascinating as an ex-accountant in terms of how do you balance the books. And yeah. we've, just, we've just closed the transfer window there. And you go on social media, and social media is mental most of the time. We need to buy him, we need to buy him. We can't buy all these players. We're in the middle of a, a pandemic. And I was astonished that we kept the players that we kept mm-hmm. and we bought the players that we bought. Because, I mean, and onto things that you have no control over, like the media. And the media were telling us Eddie's off to Villa, Ayer's off to AC Milan, uh, Cham's off to West Ham, uh, Christie's off to Burnley, Cal Max off to Leicester, and none of that happened. And the point you make there that I'm sure that a player like Callum McGregor, who's who's a brilliant player, 
you know, you forget how good he is because he's brilliant all the time. Yeah, so yeah, consistent. Every, main, every, every game, and he could easily play in that English Premier League. No bother for if it's, if it's Leicester or someone else. And so how much Carl McGregor on? I have no idea. But I'd imagine it's less than Scott Brown. And let's, for the sake of discussion, call it 20 grand a week. Mm-hmm. Am I comfortable with that? Absolutely. But if I'm Carl McGregor and I'm mixing with the Scotland squad and somebody like Ollie McBurney, who I'm not a big fan of, so I'd imagine Ollie McBurney's on a lot more than, say, 20 grand a week. So of course you'd be tempted because it's a job at the end of the day. And I don't care. I mean, you could be the most die-hard Celtic man. And, and we lost a very, you know, die-hard Celtic man in Keon Tierney. But yeah. if you're offered you know, four, five, six, seven times a salary and playing in that league, you're going to go. Absolutely, you're going to go. And that's the thing, another thing we mentioned earlier, and the thing that I'm, I'm not a big fan of English football just now, but back in the day, and I'm going to sound like one of these kind of Celtic dads, as they call them on Twitter, I loved English football back in the day, back in the 60s and 70s, because of the sheer range of number of clubs that they had. And it was really, really competitive. And I loved Scottish football back in the day when it was really, really competitive. Back in the 60s, we touched on... Bender like Bertie, which is my new play, which is about uh, the 1965 season when we won the Scottish Cup. And we do the research for that, and you look at some of the some of the crowds teams are getting. The Celtic were relatively small beer. During that season, we were getting 10,000, 12,000, mm-hmm. we were getting 30,000. Mm-hmm. But it was really, really competitive. Hearts were good, Kilmarnock were good. Uh, we had some competition there, but now we tend not to have a lot of competition. But I think, what was the question? <laughs> Probably COVID, is it? Well, yeah, but. What we started speaking about um, well, the point I was, make, sorry, was, was Christy, English I, football, Celtic I, becoming part of that. Well, it's also the fact that you, you, I, in fact, the point you were making is, is about could we do something about the international team yeah, and Christy yeah. Mixon. I think, again, it's about lack of clarity mm-hmm. and all this stuff. And I, I do accept the fact that things are changing day by day. And if this is a UEFA sanctioned tournament and you're meant to release players, then they should be saying something like, if one of your players catches us because of what we're asking you to do, mm-hmm. then your club should not be punished. And therefore, if you've got a game coming up and this player misses that, you can cancel that game, you can postpone that game. That's the rule. If they say something like that, then that's okay. I don't mind because we're going to lose Eddie or potentially lose Eddie for the next game against the bad guys and we could lose Christie. We think mm-hmm. we're definitely going to lose Christie through no fault of our own. And the fact that we've actually given players to the international team, that's unfair. If they get injured, fair enough. That comes with the territory. So that, so that that shouldn't be allowed to happen. And that'll get worse. So I think UEFA, like the SFA, like the SPFL, should come out and say, if this happens, this is what happens next. So we understand, so there's some clarity. And then getting back to the thing I said earlier about when do you call the league? You know, when do you call the league? If we called the league with less than 50% of the games played... I think it'd be hard to award that league on a points per game, whatever you want to do, type of thing. But I think we should know that now. Somebody should tell us that now. That this is this is the point. Absolutely, you should know uh, what to expect should this eventuality occur. But one thing I would like to pick your brain about, and we've spoken quite a bit uh, on the podcast previously, and um, just you know when we're chewing the fat, Jim, is back in the day and the way things went financially with Celtic. You had a specific interest in the financial element of that, being an accountant, and you were looking at the the old accounts um, back then. When you look at Scottish football just now. Uh, Celtic being a prime example of a a business that relies heavily on you know money through the turnstiles, but also the average revenue per fan within the stadium on match day and all the other revenue that that generates. And we're looking, you know, we're actually looking now at uh, a situation whereby I don't expect to be back in a football stadium this season. Yeah. I think everybody's starting to uh, become resigned to that fact, Jim. What do you think the Scottish game is going to look like once we get back to the point where fans can get back? Do you think there will be casualties? Do you think some of the casualties will be high profile? And if so, that then goes back to one of your previous points, Celtic then might have to look elsewhere. I think there's a number of things, and I think this pandemic will maybe lead to a few things. Uh, We've got too many teams in Scotland, too many top-level teams, in Scotland, uh, if you compare yourself with England, they've got 90, uh, ni- uh, 90 teams uh, with a population of 50 million, and we've got 40 odd teams with a population of five. So, if you, if you do the comparison there, if we were the same as England, we should have nine teams, not nine teams in the top league, 
nine teams in total. Mm-hmm. That's it. And that's a bit that's a bit low. And I'd always felt maybe sixteen would do it. One league of sixteen, but but but, but, but the teams are teams. They're not like part timers. Uh, and then the rest of Scottish football that becomes semi professional, regionalised, whatever it's going to be. Then the other thing that comes up from time to time is actually club looking to merge, and that's a whole kind of hot potato with all the teams. I know you come from Fife, and when you look at Fife and you look at the teams like Dunfermline and Cowdenbeath mm-hmm. and East Fife and Wraith Rovers, you know, if they merge to become you know, Fife United, for want of a better word, they could be a power. They could do something. They wouldn't compete at the kind of Celtic level, but they compete with Hibs and Aberdeen and these teams, but, but they're not going to merge. You're not going to convince a Wraith Rovers fan or Dunfermline fan to, to merge together. But maybe some sort of new team has to be formed and maybe it takes a generation for this new Fife United or Fife City to actually make some progress, get some... But it's just really, really difficult. Uh, Well, such a difference. I mean, Celtic are, you know, no matter what metric that you use, they're by far away the biggest team in the country. Yeah. Uh, By a factor of quite a lot. And then the bad guys are kind of second. And then Hibs, Aberdeen, etc. So from from here, playing teams like last week we played St. Johnson... You know, we should be beating St. Johnson because, you know, we were so, so much bigger. But you don't play football on metrics. You play football in the park, and that's why it's dead said. But we should be putting teams like that away. But so I'm a bit kind of disjointed in terms of what we're talking about. But I think there's far too many teams, and maybe this pandemic might lead to some teams not being there, which would be really, really sad given the history of some of the teams. But everything boils down to money, and you have to balance the books at the end of the day. And that's the thing about Celtic. I mean, I'm saying again I'm astonished uh, and really pleased at what's actually happened over that over that transfer window mm-hmm. can't believe what's happened can't believe how much we've spent on players and they'll be costing a lot of money you're not going to come up from the English Premiership exactly. which Shane Duffy did and mm-hmm. uh, Albi as they call him Albi Ayeti did and then we've got the man from AC Milan you're coming from Serie A so we must be paying these guys a lot of money at a time, as you say, Paul, there's no fans in the ground. Mm-hmm. And, and the money we would have made, I mean, we get a fantastic draw in the Europa. And again, we'd be going to see them playing AC Milan mm. in a couple of weeks' time. How good would that be? And the guys who go abroad, you know, we're going to take 10, 12,000 people to the San Siro. And we'd have made easily, what, four, five, six million? Yeah, absolutely. Out of the Europa. So we're not going to get that four, five, six million pound. I think we've been fortunate or we've been clever. However, it's been that we've managed to sort away quite a few bob. That's not the case with other teams. So goodness knows how they're managing to, to, to balance the books without having to go to the government and trying to be bailed out. And then, and then you compare and contrast that to what's happening in England. Where you mentioned the other day in the transfer window, what was it you said? Was it a billion pounds? Over a pound. Uh, it was just I. It was shocking amounts of money. And that's you know. why, and maybe it's just been older, I think you know money tends to kind of tends to kind of not make things better. Tends to make things worse, and uh, and that's why I'm not a big fan of English football because there's too much money sloshing about. Uh, up here, we need money to pay the players. So uh, in terms of what happens to all these teams, I don't know. I think a lot of the times maybe they don't have a lot of overheads possibly. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they don't pay the players that much. So I, I occasionally go and watch Port Juniors. And you speak to the guys who go and watch Pollock Juniors and and they'll tell me that the Pollock Juniors or the players in the junior game are actually like they paid more than the kind of bottom uh, third and fourth team in Scotland. You know, I don't think they've paid a lot as well. You know, again, I've got no idea. I'm guessing fifty quid a week or something like that, you know, so maybe they're not paying out that much and then uh, so maybe they may be giving some financial help. Mm-hmm. So, so I think teams like maybe the Aberdeens and the Hibs and the Hearts of this world, they're the ones I'd be a bit concerned about. And the thing, just I mentioned Hearts there. I would have kept Hearts in the league. I would have because this is an exceptional circumstance. I would have done something to have kept them there. They're a big club. Imagine being a Hearts fan just now. You know, uh, you've, you've no football virtually. You know, you're in the second tier now. You've got a Scottish Cup semi final coming up. You've hardly kicked the ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're losing your players. Uh, so I thought that was unfair. Uh, in my opinion, I thought there should have been. A way, a, a way of just keeping them up. Inverness as well, if you want. Have a bigger league. Uh, they could have had a league of four, uh, 14, play each other twice, 26 games, have the split, six games each, 36 games. 
You know, and it's not as if the, I think the big thing with the smaller clubs is wanting to have the two big Glasgow clubs come to town and you make your money there through the crowds, but there's no crowds. Mm. So it didn't matter this year. No. So there's no point. Plus, it's always good to watch a game at Tyne Castle. You know? It is, I think, also when you look at the, the pyramid system that was in place, Jim and the um, Furore over Breaking City, avoiding relegation and, you know, Brora Rangers, Kelty Hearts not having the opportunity uh, to to rise up that ladder. Um, so it was con- controversial, but it goes back to the point you made there where the highest echelon of Scottish football, um, when you look at them and the decisions that are made, that, that does concern me. It concerns me as we move ahead in this season, uh, due to the fact that you know we are moving into the unknown week to week, we're seeing every day new cases cropping up with footballers. Um, at what point are you able? I mean, you mentioned there uh, about games uh, being postponed. At what point would that happen? I read uh, a few weeks ago there that if you've got thirteen, you know, fit players and one of them's a goalkeeper, you must play the game. Is that the case? I mean, you're, it means you've only got two subs on the bench. Do you then have to fill the bench with 17-year-old kids who are nowhere near the first team? I just think somebody has to tell us what's happening. And these guys have paid a lot of money. You're Neil Doncasters and your and your Ian Maxwell's. I mean, is, 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 is Ian Maxwell something like 300 grand a year or something like that? 300,000 pounds. It's ridiculous. And what we're looking for is nobody knows what's going to happen, but let's plan. Let's have some scenario planning. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, we do that. And then we know what's happening because... As I said earlier, I don't think this season will finish. And I'd like somebody just to tell me that, in my opinion, I think if we play 75% of the games, that's enough games to justify whoever's won the league. If you're going to do it on a points mm-hmm. per game basis, then that's fine. So 38 games of the season, 75% must be running about 28, 29 games or something like that. So if some team has played 29 games and we have to call the season because the pandemic's got worse, we do points per game and everyone signed up to that or they, or they vote for it. But they do that now. Don't do that two days or just after it's happened because yeah. that's too late. And then you have the clarity. And as I said, because I'm a paranoid Celtic fan, you're looking at points per game. And then we got to the bit that we had the best points per game. You're thinking, call the league. Get it finished now because that's 10 because we've done points per game. It might have only played nine games. It doesn't matter. Call it now. And that's paranoid Celtic fan. You should wear that as a badge of honour. That, that's not a bad thing. Um, we've spoken a wee bit about Ryan Christie. There's loads of comments come through, Jim, when we're on a, a Celtic State of Minds uh, bulletin, and they're coming in from Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So thank you, everybody, for getting involved. We'll go over uh, to the people, the, the Celtic fans out there who may be isolating, they might be at their work, um, but certainly what they need is a Celtic fix, and that's what hopefully we provide on a daily basis. Now, Patrick Murphy is getting in touch via YouTube. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Hope the boys are doing well, first and foremost. Well, of course, that that's so important to mention that, Jim. You know, these guys, oh, they've got COVID. They've been tested positive. But, I mean, this is an unpredictable um, virus. So, so, obviously, you know, Billy Stark, Austin Edward, Ryan Christie, we do. We hope they all um, get through this uh, without any real adverse effects. It's also the thing, I just put in there, that... Nobody knows how COVID works. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this common perception of if you get it a couple of weeks, you're, 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 you're better. But I personally know people who've had it for six months and they, and they, they don't get any better and every day is really difficult for them. Mm-hmm. So who knows how Eddie is feeling or Ryan Christie. Well, Ryan Christie doesn't have it, but, but Eddie has it. So who knows what impact is going to have on him? That's a good shout. It could, I last, think, two, um, it could last two days, it could last two months. Uh, Ibrahimovic. He's right. tested positive two weeks running. So, you know, that's the thing as well. You just think, oh, you test positive 14 days later. You're in the squad. We play Rangers. Everything's fine. It might not work like that. It might not happen that way. So, absolutely. Great that's point. What, that's what I was saying earlier about. Uh, how do you say his name again? Laxalt. Laxalt. Laxalt signs on Monday. And you go on social media, like, get him in for the Rangers. Get him in, get him in. Get him in. I mean, we've no idea. I mean, we, we think we know about football... But we don't really. I mean, I've been I've played football since I was a kid, and you watch football all your life, and you think you know about it. But but compared to somebody like Neil Lennon, you know, take what I know and multiply it by, by a big big number, and that's what Lenny knows. So, do you throw the guy in? Think of all the factors involved in that. Does he speak English? Is his English any good? Is he is he is he is he married? Does he get kids? Does he get a girlfriend? Where are they? Where's he staying? How's it work? You know. So there's so many factors with this kind of stuff. <laughs> You know, and then you've got the, the you've got the COVID that sits atop the whole thing, and the concern and all the things you have to go through. So, 
No, you're, you're right. But as football fans, generally, we just, you know, we, we go, uh, you know, it's black and white and we don't think about the, the personal scenario of moving country and probably with wife and kids back home. Is he ready? Is he actually mentally ready for, the, for a no, game? The thing is, if, if, you're, if you're a lone player, in terms of the money side of things, well, who actually pays you your wages and when do you get them? Has he got his, has he got his wages like for, for, for last week, for last month? You know, these are the things that must be, because at the end of the day, players are just ordinary guys. Doing an extraordinary job, you know. So, so we can never kind of get inside their heads in terms of mm-hmm. all the things they must be thinking. So, so mentally, physically, only Lenny would know that whether he was ready for the game a week on Saturday. So, yeah. we'll see what happens. Well, Patrick goes on to say regarding the game, the game. We know the what game. game you're referring to there, Patrick. Christie wouldn't have been a starter for me if Edward is well and can get back. I'd start him. This match will be uh, about desire. Christie would have started for me. Personally, I Same. think I've been very impressed with Christie this season. Same with me, yeah. Um, there's obviously been a lot of speculation, Jim, around his future. We've mentioned it just now. He'll be talking to his pals, uh, Stuart Armstrong and uh, Kieran Tierney, who are on massive, massive wages down south. That does rub off on players. As you say, they're just humans like you and I, and they're looking for the next big move. But I think uh, Ryan Christie's performances this season have been criticised uh, by some fans in relation to uh, playing for himself, for example. And I think that was brought up the other day. And, you know, I, I had my notes in front of me for, from the second half of the Sarajevo, Sarajevo game where Ryan Christie was involved in everything positive that Celtic did. And mm. I think that, yeah, he gives the ball away. Yes, he takes risks. But the flip side of that, Jim, is that he does make things happen for Celtic. Well, he's the guy I would have in the team every single time. I think one of the things... Uh, one of the maybe not so good things this season so far is we've not been playing that well in games. We've been dominating games, but we're not that good to watch. And it's a bit slow, a bit ponderous. Apart from Ryan Christie, because he's a up and at him, dynamic player. I mean, he's a bit more dynamism in the team. And that's what was great about last Sunday from the return of league. Because I'm, I'm a huge fan of league this. He'd be the first name in my team. Because what Lee gave you last week that we haven't had all season is movement. Mm-hmm. And it was the one for 15 minutes or something and he X number of touches and that and so many shots inside the box and all this kind of stuff. He's a pest. He kept he keeps that defence moving. He goes left, he goes right, he goes down the centre. He's a fantastic player. He, he'd be the first name in my seat for next week as well. He's not match fit. Again, Lenny will know the answer to the questions, but if you can get 60 minutes out of League Griffiths next Saturday against the bad guys, then you throw him in because he will torment that team. Yeah. And even, if, again... So ignorance here. If Eddie's keeping himself fit and he's up for it, I would, I would start with the two of them and get 60 minutes with him. Another great thing about this season, which is a kind of unintended consequence, is the five subs thing. And that's, you know, that's right up our street. Mm-hmm. Because if you think about a normal kind of game, if you're, if you're not winning the game, you're looking to change either your, your forwards or your attacking midfield players. You tend to leave your kind of back four or your back three alone and your goalkeeper alone. So basically, you could change all your attacking options. You could play virtually two different attacking teams. Yeah. It's not working 60 minutes putting them on. So football's all about opinions and I'm sure people listening or watching will, will disagree. But I would certainly start with Lee and Eddie next week. And if we get 60 minutes with them both, then a Yeti, if he's fit and Polish Paddy comes on for the last half an hour. Polish Paddy indeed. That's how I'd play it. Yeah. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like the new guy to play, but it, it depends on all the factors that we just said earlier. Uh, uh, and I think... I think fans are too quick to kind of get on players' backs. So me, well, you mentioned the Finnish Varus game there, and, and and I was annoyed again. Maybe I spent too much time on social media looking at Twitter. But when when the team was announced that night, I mean, Twitter was in meltdown. No followers. What's all this about? Get Lenny to F sack Lenny. All this kind of stuff. I mean, actually, when I looked at the team again, just down to opinions, I thought, yeah, that's the team I'd have played because Eddie was injured. And the reason Eddie was injured is he got kicked up and down the park at Tannadice the previous Saturday. And that's another thing that's out with the control that you can talk about as a standard of refereeing mm-hmm. this season without sounding paranoid. Uh, if the players at Tannadice, if, if the guy up against Eddie had been booked in the first five minutes, he wouldn't have kicked him again. Eddie would have been fit. Eddie would have played against Ferenc Varas. Chances are he would have won. Chances are. Fine margins. So where he's injured, Lee's, in that game, he was a, he was a million miles away from playing. A Yeti wasn't match fit. And we've seen how Lenny and, and the backroom staff have tried to manage him to the extent that he, he gets a start a couple of weeks ago and he's off a hamstring injury. 
So these are the things that we don't know about. So you're not going to play a Yeti from the start. So what's your choices? Who who you left? You left with Paddy, Polish Paddy. Mm-hmm. And I felt sorry for him last season because if the season had finished, we'd have won the league with a few games to go. And he'd have got his chance last year. We could have seen what he'd done. For us at the Ferenc Varas game, in terms of playing real games, he'd made a couple of cameo appearances in the last 10 minutes. He looked good and he scored a goal. But this was a Champions League qualifier. Mm. And you want all your big players playing. And people say, well, play Christie, play Charm, play all these guys. And you can manage to play, actually put them all that night. Because Christie's done a job at centre forward before. So that's the team he plays. And I thought that's the right team to play. What happened on the night? First 15 minutes, it was kind of eeksy peeksy. We lose a goal because we couldn't couldn't defend a corner properly. And that's not the centre forward's fault. That was just bad defending. And from, from primary, from 15 minutes to about 90 minutes, total domination of the game. Had over 20 shots of goal. The guy you put at centre forward scores the goal. And then one lapse of concentration with the big guy at the back and we give away a daft goal. So it was hugely disappointing. But the reaction, ridiculous overreaction. So Lenny's getting in the net. Our captain's getting in the net as well. Scott Brown, unbelievable. I mean, again, this is opinions and I'm sure a lot of your audience are, are not big fans of Scott Brown. Scott Brown's a brilliant player. I mean, in fact, when he first came, I didn't think he was a brilliant player. 13 years ago, I thought we'd signed the wrong guy. I thought we'd went for Kevin Thompson because Kevin Thompson to me was, he looked more of a kind of Celtic player in terms of, he looked like a kind of combination of Alan Thompson and Tommy Burns sort of thing, you know, good left foot, keeps the game going sort of thing and Scott Brewer I didn't really see and for the first couple of seasons I couldn't see it. But obviously, I think he had a lot of personal problems. Again, yeah. things that we don't know about that are going on in people's heads and then he's made captain by Tony Mowbray which is, looking back on it was quite a an inspired thing for Mowbray to do. He didn't do much Mowbray, but he made Scott Brown captain and all of a sudden he scores a goal at Ibrox and the legend of Bruni is born. But to mm. play the number of games, did you say what, he's played 580 80 odd games, games now? Yeah. And the, and the current day and the modern day is just ridiculous. The amount of punishment these players must get. You know, I play fives and every week I'm dead sore. Okay, I'm older. Stuff like that. But people kick you, it's sore. And imagine, you know, playing 580 odd games. In front, I mean, in the midfield, in the engine room. Combative, is a, midfielder. combative yeah, yeah. Going in, getting kicked all over the park. Maybe does a, a fair bit of kicking yourself at times. But 580 games in the, in the modern environment is, is nothing short. Of, for one club, it's nothing short of astonishing. Yeah. How long do you think he can go, Jim? I think he'll go he's next thir- season. He's 35. As well. I think next season. I think obviously we'll maybe sign David Turnbull with a view to maybe. Him fitting into Brazil is a different kind of player, uh, and I think they want to keep him on the coaching staff as well because I think it's the influence he has off the pitch. Yeah, and we hear interviews with other players; they always talk about him, no matter who they are, no matter if it's a, a kind of local lad or it's somebody from you know far flung part of the world. They talk about Bruni mm-hmm. and what an, when, you know and what a great captain he is and, and what a great leader he is, and uh, and he helps him to settle and all that. Kind of, so that's just that's again that's the stuff that we don't see. You don't see that, and we saw it last Sunday where he came on, and once he came on, you can see the old maybe gave an extra five percent, an extra ten percent. Oh, definitely. And then, and then Lee Griffiths, the goal he scored last week was a fantastic goal. You know, I had, I coached kids for about twenty years or so, and if you've ever seen somebody, here's how you head. This, this is how you score a goal with your head. Just everything was perfect. His movement, how he got for the ball. I mean, he's like a good, a good. Uh, what was I going to say? He's like somebody who's a few moves ahead. Basically, and when he was leaping for that. He's thinking it's going in that corner, a foot through the post, and I'm heading it down. And all over it comes, and his neck goes back really far. Textbook header down just mm-hmm. inside the post. The keeper just kind of stood there. There's nothing to do. And I think I think that will change the season last week. There's a prediction. I think that will change the season. Me coming back will change the season because again, opinions was that people talked about last season and said I had a three five two. That's what changed the season. Yeah, it did, but not for me. It was Lee Griffiths changed the season. Okay, because I played three five two last year with Eddie and Bio. Never have been as good. Eddie and Polish Paddy. Eddie and Ryan. Eddie and somebody. Right. But Griffiths, Lee Griffiths is such a clever, clever player. And you can see that Eddie likes playing when he's mm. Lee Griffiths alongside him. Mm-hmm. And because of his movement, he's creating space for other people. And they're giving them options. And that's why I think... We, we just kicked on last year. As soon, as soon as he came back, and the goals he scores, you know, whether it's a tap in for six yards or one for 25 yards or pinger, 
he's taking corners, he's taking free kicks. I think if we can keep Lee fit, physically, mentally, because obviously he's had some issues, you keep him fit, you start him every game, because uh, he's the spark. Uh, and I think it'd be good to start him next week. And I think if we do that, we'll win the game no well next week. He is the spark, and they call him Sparky, don't Sparky, they? Yeah. Uh, Paddy Hutchison, Christie has been a driving force in the team as of late. He'll be a bigger miss than Eddie. <laughs> well, to be fair, I think... Um, I've, I've probably called his praises quite a bit this season. Jim, I'm a massive Christie fan. I'm a massive Griffiths fan. Listen, if you wear a Celtic jersey, I'll support you, you know, uh, no matter what. But there are other players who you have an affinity with. And I remember going back to last season when Griffiths came back. And every time he stood up just to get, you know, a wee run around the park or whatever, get warmed up, Jim. You could feel it around the stadium that the Celtic fans were willing him to do well. So when he eventually came back at the weekend, he's proven a lot of doubters wrong again, isn't he? We've only got to the the, at the last game of last season, 5 nothing St Mirren, he gets a hat-trick. And he was on fire that day. And he would have went on and scored another bundle of goals if he managed to play all the games. So so he's I think he's a key key player. I think if you play Eddie, Eddie's a, obviously a massive talent. You don't get to play for that French under twenty three team unless you're good, and he's and he'll have a fantastic future. He's maybe not playing so well at the moment, and part of that I think he's on his own up front. And if you've got two or three defenders, do you? And they're allowed to kick you up and down the park. Yeah. So it, if I was Eddie and I'm up there and people are kicking me all the time and I'm not getting a lot of service and there's not a lot of movement, then I'm going to struggle. And Eddie isn't somebody who can run about daft. Eddie's like give him his feet, give the ball to Eddie's feet, and he's got magic feet, and he'll, he'll do something. But if you get two big guys running about for kicking them up and doing it part of the whole game, you're not going to get a lot from them. I think it's only been the one game, maybe maybe the Hamilton game, where they showed, this is me, I can do this. Since then, it's maybe a wee dip in form, but he'll come back because he's, he's such a talent. And again, I still want to be kept him. I know. Given some of the things you're saying, because he's he's mixing with the French under-23 team. Yeah. And they'll be on even sillier money than some of the guys you mentioned before. So... Again, I think it's just astonishing we've managed to keep all these players, sign the guys that we've signed. Brilliant. No, it has been. And, you know, the big thing that's always going to be missing this season, unfortunately, Jim, is us being there. You know, we've, for example, uh, last season, we're thinking, how are you going to celebrate that? It's difficult. And this season is going to be the exact same. But the, the priority, obviously, is to ensure uh, everybody's safety. And we, and we get that. But there, there needs to be, like you say, some kind of plan. It's almost as if, I always refer back to Wallace and Gromit where the dog is on the on the train and he's laying the track as we go along. I feel like that's what we are doing this season. We don't know what's in the corner yeah. and we're just feverishly trying to figure it out as we go along. Um, some great points coming in from last night's internationalist, uh, international games, rather. Helen McCallum. Welcome back to the show, Helen. You're saying that a couple of positive coronavirus tests in the Republic of Ireland camp. Hope Shane Duffy isn't next. And follower Celtic, who regularly gets involved in the bulletins. Afternoon, PJ and Jim. Wasn't McGregor beat on it in Hamid, El Hamid good last night? I thought they were great. Well, I thought it was interesting, the fact they put the big guy left back. I know. And you thought, He's so adaptable, oh, Jim. But then so you adaptable. Thought, then you thought, well, maybe we didn't have to sign... A new guy. Maybe we could have put the big man at left back because I think he's he's, he's a really good player. El Hamad. When, when he played Ibrox uh, in the two 0 game last year, I think it was his first or second game. It was pretty early on. For a big guy, he's got really good feet. You know, he can beat a player, and he obviously laid on the cross last week. You know, so a lot. So big fan of El, El Hamad. As I said earlier, like Carl McGregor's just just a brilliant player. Another thing is, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, if you're Carl McGregor, you know that you know if you wanted to. You could, you know, multiply your salary by a big number playing this Razamataz league. Mm-hmm. You know, and but he's still here, which is which is great. And he never makes um, any kind of drama. No, absolutely. No. He gets on with that. I said it quite a, quite a few times last season as well about McGregor. Is his level of consistency sometimes means that. Um, his level of performance is taken for granted so if someone else performed like that they're man of the match but Cal McGregor does it week in week out so it's almost as if you expect it from him Aye. and you'd also I mean if, if you're looking at it uh, from, that, from an objective point of view once we do the 10 mm. then that's been achieved what happens next you know so if you're maybe thinking oh, I'll just stay for the 10 and I'll go and then people then those players will go with their best wishes because they've achieved the 10 uh, so it'll be interesting after this season, no matter what happens this season, whether we get the 10 or if we don't get the 10, what kind of interest will be then? 
Because going for 11 is not, <laughs> it doesn't have the cachet of we're going for 10. Unless we get the trebles going. Unless we do the quadruple treble, then if a number five trebles means and then six trebles, that, that. So I think the club needs something to hook something on, you know, after this season. Otherwise, I think there may be a big drop off. And also, getting back to money again, people, it's, it's very expensive doing watch football. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that we've paid out all this money to watch the game in the telly, you know, there's all these dodgy feeds you can watch games when, but. But Celtic fans have stepped up, as have the fans across the city and Aberdeen have stepped up and bought a ridiculous number of season tickets, knowing virtually they'll not get to watch any football. So uh, so what happens next year? I don't think they'll do the same thing again. I don't think people will be paying that kind of money. If if the big pivotal season's over, good or bad, once that's over, I can't see 50,000 Celtic fans paying for a virtual season ticket next year. If I've done the, I've done the 10 or not done the 10, I just can't see it. Unless there's some sort of hook in there. I think again, looking at the uh, the situation last season and this season, Jim, the future is so you know up in a- up in air at the moment with regards to what's going to happen. Is the season going to finish? Even if it does finish, what is Scottish football going to look like uh, when we get back to playing? That's where we start begging the question: Where will Celtic be playing their football? Should they play down in England? A lot of people will scoff at that right off the bat and say that's not going to be possible. Some other fans look at the English game and say, well, I don't want Celtic to become part of that. Um, There's other uh, possibilities in the future. I just think there's going to be so many things that in a year's time we'll look back on this and it wouldn't have seemed possible. But the circumstances um, around the coronavirus and uh, the casualties, and I don't just mean individual, but businesses, um, will really uh, be the driving force as to where Celtic end up. Well, that'll come back to money, as it always does. Everything must come back to money. And... uh whether Celtic would be invited to join some sort of English or UK league, um, you looked upon the, the kind of skies of this world or the BTs of the world, they'd be the driving force behind making something like that happen. Uh, said to you before I've come on here, I'd love some sort of European league, mm-hmm. some sort of proper European league, where we go in Division 3 or Division 4 or something like that, and you get relegation, and you go up the leagues and you go down the leagues, because I'd much rather we were playing teams of a kind of level standing and as I said earlier by any metric you want to use we are the most we are the biggest club in the, in this in this country so you know if you're playing Ross County you're playing Livingston or Hamilton then these teams have got hardly any money at all so I'd rather from a from a, from a spectacle point of view be playing teams of the kind of same level and I find that and maybe again it's a kind of getting getting older thing is it when you're maybe younger and maybe Maybe going back to the eighties, there it was more competitive. You didn't mm. know we we're going to win games. You know, if we, if we played Aberdeen at home, if we can win today, it'd be a big thing. Whereas just now, if we don't beat Aberdeen at home, that's a disaster. So there's too much at stake, and it's the old cliche: every point's a prisoner. I think. So a lot of the time, you don't enjoy the games; you endure the games until you get three goals ahead, and then you go into the enjoyment section. <laughs> You can sit back and say, I'm actually enjoying this now. Let's get some more goals. But until you get that three goals ahead, and the game, I think I said last time was one, the Hamilton game last year was a, was a point in case. Freezing cold December night, mm-hmm. sitting shivering. Mm-hmm. We're one goal up, we're not playing particularly well. And you know they're going to score. You know they're going to score. And then they score in the 90th minute. And, you think, oh, and then Brunei pops up and wins the game. And everyone thinks the world is great again. The Livingston game this season, another point in case. Uh, when, when Albi, as they, as they call him, makes it makes it three one. You're thinking, right, go on now, let's let's get a few more goals now. And it doesn't happen, and the big guy that's one from thirty yards. All of a sudden, the endurance factor goes up like by factor of ten, and the guy missed the one in the last few seconds of the game. I mean, it was easy to score that, and all of a sudden, they drop two points and be crisis time again. So, it's an endurance. I found watching the games far more stressful this season than it was last. Last season was quite stressful watching the games. This season it's even more just because you need to win the games. And imagine what Lenny feels like. I know. Because basically, you win the 10, he's, a, he's an absolute legend. You know, he won't be a legend for like the next few weeks, next months. It'll be forever. And if I go back to my play, just to bend the light back, there's a, there's a comment one of the characters makes about, should Rangers make 10 in a row? They'll not be ripping the pish for a few weeks or a few months. It'll be all fucking eternity. <laughs> And that's what this is like. So mm-hmm. so the mindset we had back in 97, 98, hoping that, that, that they didn't do the 10, across the city, that's what they're thinking just now. They can't do the 10. It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable from yeah. their point of view. Mm-hmm. Unthinkable from their point of view because Lisbon Lions were the guys who'd done the 9. They can't beat the Lisbon Lions record. 
So whatever I'm thinking, the stresses that I think, multiply it by a big number. That's Lenny. And that's why I think we need to support him. Encourage him. By all means, if he makes mistakes, maybe I wouldn't have done that. Maybe Fine. But don't go over the top. Get behind him. Get behind the players. This is the season. And I think it starts a week on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And it starts because hopefully Lee Griffiths is on the park making it happen. And that, that would be brilliant. To see him return at the weekend there was fantastic. And, um, you know, like yourself, he's not going to be 100% fit. You know, I totally I totally get that. But because of what he brings to the, the team, um, I think it would be something that I would consider uh, would be to play Griffiths. And I did, when I predicted the lineup yesterday, I did predict that. That's ever-changing, obviously, with, with the current situation. Some great points coming through. But before we're able to look at any of the others, you mentioned Bendit like Bratback. Uh, people tuning in to a Celtic state of mind may be aware that you have been involved for a few years now, Jim, in writing plays, but that has developed and there is a new project underway and um, we've spoken to someone who is going to star in your next show. Tell us all about Bend It Like Bertie. Bend It Like Bertie is a follow-up to Bend It Like Bratback. The kind of feedback we got from that play was just astonishing. We ended up putting it on the, on the SEC. So it starts off as some wee daft play that I'm writing and all of a sudden you're on the SEC and you're getting to meet ex, ex-Celtic players which is which is phenomenal so Bender like Bertie takes place uh, January 65 to April 65 it's the Scottish Cup run it's just when Bertie comes back and, and Jock Steen comes back and uh, Des McLean's going to be in Des McLean's an incredibly funny funny guy so it's on next May because I'm hoping that when we get to next May we're back to some sort of normality and it's on the Cup final weekend so it's on the Friday the 7th, 8th and 9th of me at Webster's, so I'll be putting something on social media at some point soon uh, to do with that. We met Bertie uh, a few couple of months ago. Uh, imagine meeting Bertie Old. Imagine meeting Bertie Old. Imagine sitting down and chatting to Bertie Old because, as the song goes, everyone loves Bertie, uh, and it was it was brilliant just to kind of sit as we we're sitting just now across with Bertie Old and chatting to him for the best part of about an hour and a half, socially distance, of course, and hearing these stories and stuff like that, and basically. The meeting was about just telling them there's this play on called Bender Like Bertie and Des was there as well. And Des will be playing Bertie Old and there's a fantastic Bertie Old impersonation. Uh, so so that's kind of coming soon. Uh, that'll be the next Celtic play. Well, the thing with that is um, after speaking to you a few months back when we were at Cathcombe Park and uh, we put the podcast out, you told me your plans. You also put me in touch with Des and we were able to speak to Des during lockdown. And uh, he gave us some examples of, of what he can do, but he also spoke a bit about the next play. And as you say, I've had the, the great pleasure of uh, speaking to Bertie Old myself uh, on one occasion. And he doesn't disappoint, does he? You've got this image in your mind. You've got this impression of what Bertie Old will be like. You were showing me some fantastic images of him when he played. And you think back to this guy and Everything about him back then, though, Jim, you know, the brow creamed hair, the way that they dressed, um, eventually when he became a manager with a cigar. I just, I, you know, I had this image in my mind of what Bertie was like. And when I spoke to him, you know, he lived up to that. He was he was absolutely superb. And he spoke so fondly of his time at Celtic, of course, but also of Neely Mocking, who he had played with. You know, if, if it hadn't been for Neely, Bertie Old would have played in the 7 1 game. That's mm-hmm. astonishing. Yeah. And then 10 years later, he's winning the European Cup for Celtic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you just cherish all these men, don't you? All, all the remaining Lions. And I think that when we finally get out of this, when we finally do get through this, and we will get through it, Jim, um, being able to go with fellow Celtic fans to the game, absolutely looking forward to that. But getting together for something like this in May would be fantastic as well. Was it May next year? So on May 7th, 8th and 9th, cup finals yeah. on the 8th, so hopefully we're at cup final as well on that day. So that's, uh, here's hoping. That's uh, oh, absolutely. But, but Bertie was just, to, to, to sit in his presence for, for 90 minutes, and until I started writing these plays, I never envisaged that you would end up you know, going to the SEC with these things. And I've met all these ex-Celtic players, and uh, and I'm somebody who never actually met ex-players, but all of a sudden I've got I've get ex-Celtic players' phone numbers in my and my phone contact, and I show off to my pals, look at this. <laughs> that's Murdo McLeod, that Just is. Just don't lose your phone. That's Murdo McLeod, that is. He's a pal. There's Joe Miller. He's a pal. So, uh, here's Paul John Dykes. He's not a pal. So no, no I, I thought I was. He's a colleague. He's a colleague. So, uh, so, it's been so much fun. And then, 
Because once it's to meet Bertie, just to tell him, there's this thing called Bender like Bertie coming on, and there's a bit of poster, then you'll be on the poster. And what I love about the plays, writing the plays, they're kind of comedy nostalgia plays, so they have to make me laugh. And again, maybe it's a sign of getting old. And you just said that there about you know, the image of Bertie old, and the hair and the dress sense and all this sort of stuff. When you do get back and you look at stuff in the 60s, and it's fascinating, and some of the stuff that leaps out the page at you, and if you tend to... Within the play, it goes through sort of January 65 to April 65. So you're looking at the games we played during that period. And the home games were getting 10,000 people, 12,000 people. That was that was the attendance because it was like 12 years, I think it was, since we last won the league. 11 years since we last won the cup. So it's similar to kind of Bender like Bratback because Bratback was about this, at the season we stopped to 10 because it was like nine years since we won the league. So it's a similar period. But, but where it's different from Bender like Bratback is that in 97-98... Celtic had been a big team. They had won the European Cup. Mm-hmm. They were known throughout the world. They're a big team. They've had success. Whereas in 1965, Celtic, they're not that much better than Hibs or Aberdeen or Kilmarnock. You know, that, they've, they've never done any significant. It's been 12 years since they won the league. So it's a similar type of period where you're looking at something whereby we haven't won anything in ages. You know, and there's a great quote. Uh, and I've, and I've, I've also met John Fallon, there you go, another name dropper, who, who's a big fan of the play, big fan of Ben Lee Bradback. And I read John Fallon's book, and it's a brilliant phrase in it. When he talked about when Jock Steen came and they finally won the Cup in 65, he said, we no longer had a slave mentality. Such a brilliant phrase, mm-hmm. you know, compared to the team across the city. We had a slave mentality. And and I'm not saying, maybe that's not the right thing to say in these current times, but, but seeing yourself as you know, the underdog and not being able to kind of achieve what you'd like to achieve, even though you're good enough to achieve that, but always come in second. Mm-hmm. That must be the mindset of the bad guys at the moment. You know, there's a game coming up next week. They'll be wary of coming to Celtic Park because they know this is the big game. They know this is it. Uh, and whether they have that kind of mentality, chances are they do. But Celtic, certainly in 1965, that's the mentality they had uh, because of what was happening Across the city, mm-hmm. other teams were winning the league. And that's all, and that's that. Maybe wasn't which wasn't as bad in nineteen sixty five. It wasn't like the bad guys were going for ten in a row because like Hearts won the league that season. Sorry, Kilmarnock won the league that season. They beat Hearts in goal average. Goal average. You know, Dundee yeah. had won that few season. Teams like you know not that long before that. East Fife were a big team. Stuff like this, you know, and people, younger people, you know, don't get that. And one of the things that came out of Ben and Brad back was a number of people who came up to me and said. I took my 19-year-old son, he couldn't understand this. What's this, Rangers going for 10 in a row? What's this about? Couldn't understand why Celtic were so bad, so poor. So it's a bit of a history lesson for, for that kind of age group. Not, mm-hmm. not for guys like yourself who obviously lived through the 97, 98, but you didn't live through 1965, neither did I. So when Ben like Bertie comes, you know, there's going to be bits of that that you're thinking, did that happen? I didn't mm-hmm. know that. Mm-hmm. Some of the smaller details within that. And one of the things I do is, uh, between each scene, you give a kind of catch up, so I do. I'll put, I'll put a video, and there'll be a song of that that within that four month period, and it will show the scores since the last game, just to keep you up to date with what's actually happening. And then this time, I've put uh, the size of the crowds on it, so you've got you know Celtic Clyde ten thousand five hundred, mm-hmm. and that was January the second. Because back in the day, here's another wee lesson for your for your audience. Back in the day, when they got to New Year's, you played two games in two days, right? So they played the Rangers game. And New Year's Day, uh, lost 1-0. Bobby Murdoch missed a penalty in the last 10 minutes. Jimmy Johnson got sent off in the first half. Surprise, surprise. And then he played Clyde the next day at Celtic Park and drew one each at Clyde in front of a crowd of 10,500 or something. And then even the other games in that period, the home games, poor, poor crowds. Nothing, nothing more than about 20, apart from the cup. The fancy to come out for the cup. And maybe back then the cup was a bigger thing. And we spoke before as well, we were talking English football and I was just talking about the fact that back in the 50s and 60s, the FA Cup was much bigger than the league down there. Mm-hmm. But in terms of that, uh, Ben like Bertie, it's a bit of a history lesson for, for people like me, people like you, but there'll be guys who obviously lived through that. And one of the things I was keen to do was speak to people who were there. And my big idea for the play was, I'm going to have it all on a supporters bus. It's just on the supporters, but they're going to the game, they're coming back for the game, and they're talking about the games and other things in life, type of thing. But I then felt that was too restrictive to do that. But then I thought, well, I'll make my main character 
a supporters bus convener. And then I thought, I need to find somebody who was a supporters bus convener in 1965. And fortuitously, uh, the Bertie Old CSE from Mary Hill, and Declan McConville, who's a regular contributor to Celtic State of Mind, he knew somebody who was the convener of the Shakespeare bus that ran out of Raybury Street in Mary Hill back in the 60s. And what a lovely man, this guy, was Jim Divers. I went to see him and he had all this detailed information about what life was like in 1965, going to Aberdeen, where his mum would make up pieces and he would sell them on the bus. And stuff. Like that. Didn't have motorways back there. So going to Aberdeen was maybe having to have an overnight stay and all this kind of stuff. And, and stuff that we take for granted yeah. these days. And I was thinking of it the other day about, I was chatting to somebody about the fact that when I'm at the game, I feel I have some sort of influence over the game. I know it's bonkers, but, but I'm, I'm there because Eddie's there. And I say, well, one Eddie, finger out your ass, give it to you. Know, now, obviously, Eddie doesn't hear me, but I think I'm influencing the game in some way. And if I can't go to the games, I can't influence the games. I watch you on the telly, and you still shout at the telly, obviously, but Eddie can't hear you, but you still do it. So you've got these bits, you need to be at the game. If you can't be at the game watching the telly, listen to the radio, that's, that's just torture. That's just a nightmare. Or you get text updates and stuff like these days. And then back in the day, you had the video printer. Yeah. You're too young for that. Yeah, no, I remember the that. Video printer. Yep. The thing typed out. And then you'd the guy doing the classifieds and you could tell by the tone of his voice. So it's like, you know, Aberdeen 2, they've won. Aberdeen 2, or oh, they've lost. I think so. So, <laughs> so you back through the years and think of all this kind of stuff. So I must be at the game so I can shout nonsense. Uh, and because I know I'm 150 yards away, but it doesn't matter. I'm influencing the game. And football fans are incredibly superstitious. So they've got all these routines or rituals you would do going to the game you don't no longer do. What's yours, Paul? What's your question? My What's ritual. Your ritual? Yeah, superstition My ritual. going to the game. I never ever wear a Celtic top. Never ever wear a Celtic top right. to the games. Never have done. So what do you do? What things do you do? I do this. Um, Drink the same pub, you wear the same socks, that kind of stuff. No, you see, this is the thing. Although I'm superstitious, and I am superstitious in many, many ways, there's not a, a process that I would go through. My superstition would always be that I don't. And if, if I did turn up to a Celtic game wearing a Celtic top, I would believe that we were going to get beat because right. it's gone on so long. So don't do it then. Like, don't so do it. I won't don't do, do, I won't do, do it. it. Right. Um, in terms of drinking in a pub, I, I don't go drinking on match day. So I normally drive because I'm travelling to the game. Right. Uh, from outside of Glasgow, so... So there's no lucky socks? There's no lucky socks or underwear scarf. or anything like that. No Nothing. colours, no colours. No colours? No colours. Right, okay. no. And you think that's worked? <laughs> it has worked, and that's why I can't change it. Can't change I it. cannot change that, because it so would you, drive me wild. So when you watch the game in the house, do you sit in the same chair? Uh, no. No? No, no. It's quite controversial. No, I don't. I, I mean... You don't have a lucky chair? I don't, because okay. if I do that... I would go insane. I'm that superstitious, so I can't get right. into that. So no lucky chair? No. Okay. Nothing like that. I mean, you sit in the chair, do you sit in a certain way? Do you, do you put your legs, your right leg over your left? Or <laughs> I don't even think about that. No, no, I do. I, I don't even think about that. I actually put my right leg over my left uh, knee. That's it. I have to sit this You're way. You're taking that to extremes, that well, you have to be. superstition. It's such, a, it's such a big season. And it's it's at the margins. And these things make a difference. In my head, they make a difference, and that's the most important thing. The thing is, what you said about the game, that resonates with me. That You think by being there, you can influence the game. Oh, I, um, totally. I don't mean in an Uri Geller kind of way, like you make the, the ball bend and hit the post. I don't mean like that. But Celtic fans collectively can influence a game. They, they definitely can. Jim. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, especially games where it's tight, 10 minutes to go, and, and they've, you know, they've seen over the years, and you think about the... the, the Came to Rugby Park, was it two seasons ago now? I'm trying to think Scott Brown's late. Number of late goals where you think, you know, some of that was doing the fans is actually cheering them on. And that's what it's different this year. And that's why it was so great getting those late goals last week. Because having the fans there last week would have made a difference. Uh, but yeah, I certainly influenced the game when I'm there. I know that. And I made, I made a point, I think, in, a, in, in the first player, uh, one, of the, one of the characters says something like that. Uh, and and he felt bad because he felt that he could control the defence better. So if the defence were too far away, that was no good. Whereas if the goalkeeper was out in front of him, then he felt more <laughs> confident because I can control the defence. But that second half, they were miles away. How can I control the defence if they're miles away from me? And that's the time that everyone shouts at football and it's bonkers. But somebody's going to a football match for the first time. And that's what my plays are about. You can have somebody looking at somebody at a football match for the first time and what they do 
Well, you stand up and, and shout. Mm-hmm. Nobody can hear you. You know, get it to you. Know, you're a clown and this kind of stuff. So, so why do you shout? Do you do it for yourself? Is it just a natural impact? Is it superstition? Is it a, you know? So you know, and all the kind of rituals that you go through, and, and all the singing that you do, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's just madness. But you miss the madness, and that's that's the thing. That's the outlet. Jim, that, that yeah, yeah it allows us to get to that level. Now, it's been absolutely fascinating, Jim, and hopefully you're able to come in on a regular basis to the, the studio and join me for a Celtic State of Minds bulletin uh, over the next uh, few weeks and months as we move into the unknown. Um, but there's been loads of comments coming through. And I will go through as many as I possibly can tomorrow morning and uh, during the rest of today. But all that's left for me to say today, Jim, is thank you very much for joining me once again on A Celtic State of Mind. Thanks, Paul.